If there's one thing that I've learned from watching way too many explosion and fire videos, it's that the key to science is to hold grudges. But, you see, I have a problem. Most days, I wear my biologist hat, so unlike explosions and fire, the grudge I hold can't be to anything even vaguely yellow. All yellow chemistry is trash. Because, well, literally everything in biology is yellow. The media is yellow, the reagents are yellow. Even the way we figure out how much bacteria is in a tube is by measuring how yellow it is. So I have to choose my grudge more specifically. And here it is, this little tube of evil. Inside the tube is my arch nemesis. Rather than a color, it's a specific type of bacteria. And no, this isn't some terrifying pathogen. This is the most frustrating bacteria genetic engineers like myself usually work with. BL21 E. coli. There are many varieties of E. coli, each with things that they're good at, and all with shared characteristics. Let's start with what they all share. First, they all smell like butthole, and it's one of my least favorite parts of doing microbiology. This is because it's one of the first bacteria to have ever been isolated and cultured. However, that culture was taken from a stool sample. And it's also one of the reasons why I am desperately trying to find a different model organism to work with. Second, they're all gram-negative, which means that they have two membranes, an inner and an outer one, with a space in between for proteins and polysaccharides. They're all also the same species, so share a lot of the same genome. But that's where the similarities mostly end. Where they're all different is that each strain will have various genes throttled up or down, or entirely knocked out, which means that it gives them wildly different properties. For example, my favorite strain for everyday work is a strain from a company called NEB called NEB Turbo. This strain was made by growing a bunch of E. coli on plates and then selecting the colonies which grew the fastest. This was repeated over and over again until they had a strain that would form colonies in as little as six hours. This is frankly incredible as it means if you hustle you can get two whole cloning runs done in a single 12 hour day. They're also incredibly easy to modify and you can practically fart DNA in their general direction and they'll take it up. However, the biggest issue with these is they were only selected for speed. This means they're terrible at just about everything else. So once you modify them with new DNA, it takes them ages to produce enough of your protein of interest to be really useful. BL21 is exactly the opposite. They grow more slowly, but are incredible at producing proteins. Their biggest downside, though, is they are maddeningly difficult to modify. For context, here are two plates side by side. On the left is NEB Turbo, on the right is BL21. They were both transformed using the same protocol which I showed in the previous video. Same DNA, and same amount of DNA. With Turbo, you get loads of colonies, but with BL21, you're lucky if you get even a small handful. A single colony is considered a win. But while we're comparing these two, here are what the two strains look like after the same amount of growth time. As before, they're carrying the same DNA, but after two days of growing, the Turbo show almost no color while the BL21 are brightly colored. This is why BL21 is useful and what makes it so annoying that they're hard to modify. I've struggled with this for years and would avoid BL21 like the plague because 50% of the time, I'd go through all that effort of transformation protocols just to wind up with a sad empty plate at the end. Meaning I'd have to do it over and over, burning time and reagents trying to get the damn thing to work. I should say though, biologists are second only to YouTubers as some of the most superstitious people you'll meet. If you told us that sacrificing a goat before running a protocol makes it work every time, you bet your ass we're going to start keeping a small herd of goats handy. And stuff like this is why. I'd do the same protocol over and over and it felt like random chance that it would actually work. But all of that changed recently when I was tinkering and made some changes to the protocol and this happened. Suddenly, I had hundreds of colonies on a plate and not only that, but managed to do so consistently. So I knew I couldn't keep the recipe to myself and had to share it with all of you. And best of all, with this protocol, even the most user-friendly strains transform super well. You just need to scale back how much DNA you use or you're going to actually get too many colonies, which frankly is a good problem to have. If this is your first time learning about genetically modifying bacteria, here are the bullet points. I have some DNA that comes in the form of what's called a plasmid. Sort of like Bioshock, but less shooting spiders and lightning and more make a bacteria fluorescent. It's a small circle of DNA that carries a few genes, including the one I'm interested in, which in this case is for a fluorescent protein, just so it's easy to see what's going on. The plasmid also contains a gene that will make whatever bacteria we put it into resistant to an antibiotic. This allows us to select for the bacteria that take up this new DNA because the unmodified ones won't grow on media containing that antibiotic. 
If you'd like a more thorough explanation, I've linked to some videos below where I talk about the fine details in greater depth. The DNA comes as a solution in buffered water, which in this case I prepared myself by extracting it from some previously modified E. coli. One of the main things I use E. coli for in the lab is as basically tiny copying machines. When I order DNA from companies like AdGene, it often doesn't come as pure DNA in water, but carried by live bacteria. So the first thing I do when I receive it is grow some of that bacteria, and then do a DNA extraction so the pure stuff can be frozen and stored for later use. To get the DNA into the bacteria, I'm going to be using a technique called heat shock. Basically, after a series of washing steps to get the bacteria ready, they're mixed with the DNA and cooled down for a few minutes. Then, once they've had time to chill, they're rapidly heated to a temperature which is high enough to stress them out almost to their breaking point, before being rapidly cooled down again. No one has empirically proven how this works, but the story professors tell their undergrads is that during the heating process, the membranes of the bacteria sort of melt, and holes form in them, allowing the DNA to diffuse inside. When we cool them back down, the DNA is trapped as the holes close back up again. Again, this is a lovely story, but no one actually knows if it's true. But ultimately, it doesn't matter because it's quite effective. Okay, let's give it a whirl and see how this is done in practice. And for those looking to follow along in your own labs, I've linked to a written version of the protocol below. To start, we need to grow the bacteria up overnight so they're fresh. I loaded 10 milliliters of sterile LB broth into a sterile tube, then inoculated it with some BL21 cells. This was then loaded into my new incubator that rotates the tubes as well as keeping them warm. It was set to 37 degrees Celsius and I just let this go overnight. I bought this new incubator specifically for this function, but it was rather expensive. If you don't want to shell out for something this fancy, my friend Sebastian built his own tube tipping setup using a simple motor and 3D printed parts. He also made a version out of a handful of connects and it works just as well. But the rotation to keep the liquid moving is one of the biggest things that makes the protocol work as it makes the bacteria grow much faster. The next day, a fresh 10 milliliter tube of broth was prepared and inoculated using 100 microliters of the overnight solution. This time, we're only going to let it grow for one or two hours. One of the things that screw up BL21 transformations is the cultures are just too old. I've found if they aren't extremely actively growing, this just doesn't work. Even leaving this for half an hour too long cuts the efficiency down immensely, so don't let it go longer than two hours. The reason we inoculate 10 milliliters worth of broth is that there won't be that many cells after such a short growth period, so we need to make a lot of it so we have enough to work with. While that's growing, I need to prepare a 100 millimole calcium chloride solution, which is my transformation buffer. I made this by dissolving 1.1 grams of calcium chloride in 10 milliliters of distilled water, which is now my one molar stock solution. Whenever I need to make transformation buffer, I take one milliliter of this and add nine more mils of distilled water, and then I filter sterilize it to get the solution ready. Sterilizing filters like this are super easy to get on eBay, and I keep a jar of them handy, which has been autoclaved for whenever I need to do this. The nice part about this is that there's no heat needed to make the solution sterile, so it's usable immediately, rather than having to run the autoclave and let it cool down for a few hours. After about an hour and a half, I took the tube of bacteria out of the incubator and spun it down in a centrifuge at max speed. This collects all the cells at the bottom of the tube into a soft pellet. The spin time will depend on your centrifuge, but in my case, about 2 or 3 minutes is plenty. Remember to add a second tube on the opposite side of the centrifuge with the same amount of liquid in it to balance it, or the centrifuge will break violently and hurt you. The LB broth was then carefully dumped out without disturbing the pellet. Then 1 milliliter of our sterile calcium solution is added and the pellet is resuspended. This liquid can then be transferred to a smaller 1.5 mil tube so it's a little easier to work with. Again, we spin down the liquid, this time I'm using my mini centrifuge. It spins a lot faster, so 30 seconds is sufficient this time. Since this is a small amount of liquid, I removed it using a sterile pipette. Then a fresh milliliter of calcium solution is added, and a pipette is used to gently resuspend the pellet, by pipetting up and down slowly. One final time the solution is spun down, the calcium is removed, and this time it's replaced with a much smaller amount of calcium solution. There should be enough cells here to do at least 3 or 4 reactions, so add 100 microliters for each reaction you want to perform. If you're only doing one, like I am, just use 100 microliters. If you're doing multiple, after resuspending the pellet, pull off 100 microliters at a time and transfer them to a fresh tube for each reaction you want to perform. Now it's time for the DNA. For BL21, we really want to shotgun a ton of DNA in here to give the best chance of success. I'm using 8 microliters of my DNA stock solution, which is about 400 nanograms of DNA. 
This is frankly a ridiculous amount for bacteria, and for most other strains, 50 nanograms is even almost in excess. You don't always need to go with this much, but for stubborn plasmids, it's better to overshoot. The DNA is mixed with the suspended cells, and then the tubes are placed in the fridge for 25 minutes and allowed to rest. After they've had time to chill, it's heat shock time. Before beginning, my heat block was turned on and set to 42 degrees Celsius. This was another homemade gadget I made a couple years ago, and I've linked to a video below if you want to see how I made it. Ultimately, it's just a block of aluminum with a Peltier and thermocouple that'll warm up to the temp I set it to and stay there. The other thing we need to prepare in advance is an ice bath to cool the cells down after we heat them. Traditionally, this is done with a bucket of ice water, but what I've taken to using is a styrofoam container full of frozen peas. I like this because unlike ice water, they don't melt and can be reused many times and refrozen easily. When everything is ready, the tube, or tubes, of cells are popped into the heat block for exactly 90 seconds, and allowed to warm up. I keep a timer next to me so I can do this as accurately as possible. Keep in mind, the bacteria are slowly dying at this temperature, so keeping them hot for too long will absolutely kill them. Once the time is up, the tube is immediately transferred to the ice bucket and allowed to chill for 3-5 to five minutes. After the cells are cold again, 1 milliliter of fresh LB broth is added to each tube. Then the tubes are placed into an incubator with mixing for 2 hours to grow. This gives the bacteria enough time to start producing the antibiotic resistance genes so they don't all die when we plate them later. The final trick to this protocol being successful is how we actually plate the cells. Normally, protocols say to take 100 microliters of the growing solution and spread it onto a petri dish that has the appropriate antibiotic in the media. But I find this to be a bit of a crapshoot on whether or not you get enough good cells. So instead, I spin down the tubes for a few seconds to pellet all of the cells. Then I suck up the entire pellet along with enough media to spread it around and spread this mixture onto the plate. For spreading, I found that you must use something solid, like an inoculation loop or a dedicated sterile spreader, and things like swabs lower the efficiency as they suck up too many of the cells. But with that done, the plate can be loaded into the incubator to grow, and the protocol is complete. In a day or two, you should be greeted with dozens of colonies carrying your gene of interest. However, sometimes this actually works way too well. Some plasmids are just a lot less toxic than others, and so the bacteria take them too well. As such, you may end up with so many colonies that it starts looking like a big smudge. Again, I see this as a good thing. Once I know that everything is working properly, I start scaling back the various parts of the protocol. Maybe I plate less bacteria, or I use less DNA during the transformation. I find it easier to overshoot and then scale back instead of undershooting and wondering what went wrong. So for tricky plasmids that are stubborn, go hard on the DNA and plate everything. But for things you know will work well, a much smaller amount of DNA or bacteria is fine. Just adjust for your experiment. But the full strength version is basically guaranteed to work even if your reaction is normally stubborn. In any case, it means that finally my nemesis has been slain, and I've taken to using them all the time in the lab. After all, they are very useful, the only issue with them was how difficult it was to transform them. Here are some plates I made that carry my entire collection of fluorescent and chromoproteins, all now in BL21 E. coli. I now have 18 in total, and also have one that produces melanin, thanks to my friend Sebastian Kosioba. You'll be seeing me use this entire collection in my next video, where I'm using my new bio-robot to make agar art using all these different colors. Which, if you think that sounds cool, you should subscribe to see when that video goes up. And it just wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't figured out the changes that made it easy to get all the different plasmids into BL21. Now, before I wrap up, I need to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. While I use antibiotic resistance genes to protect the bacteria I care about, NordVPN is one way to protect yourself while you're online. For those that don't know, NordVPN is a virtual private network service. Normally, when you're browsing, you connect directly to a website, but when you do this, your ISP, or whoever's Wi-Fi you're using, can see what sites you're browsing. They may not be able to see what you're doing on the sites you visit, but just knowing what sites people visit can tell you a lot about them. The way it works is that Nord acts like a middleman, so instead of directly connecting to the next site on your internet rabbit hole, you first connect to Nord's super fast servers, and that's all your ISP, or other people watching, can see. From there, your traffic is forwarded to your site of choice, and you have much more privacy. The other great part of this is that it can unblock sites which may not be available to you. Here in Canada, I often get this annoying message that says certain videos or sites aren't available in my country. Using Nord's more than 5,500 servers in 60 countries, you can make your traffic look like it's coming from the right country and get around that without issue. 
For Nord's ninth birthday, every purchase of a two-year plan comes with a bonus one month free and a surprise gift, which you can get by using the promo code ThoughtEmporium or visiting nordvpn.com slash ThoughtEmporium. So protect yourself online today by clicking the link in the description or going to nordvpn.com slash ThoughtEmporium to get in on this great deal. And finally, I need to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi that make these videos possible. For those interested, patrons and members also get access to my supporter Discord. So if that's something that interests you, or you just want to help keep the flow of science videos coming, there's some links below. And for now, that's where I'll leave it. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing and ring that bell to see when I post new videos. And leave me a comment below with what you want to see me genetically modify next. Also, don't forget to head over to my other social media pages to see what I'm working on long before it ends up in videos. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.